David, I'm so honored to have you. This is David Hodges. I've been listening to your lectures mm -hmm. for the past two days. I send you an email. I said, I've been convicted. <laughs> I've been full of hope. It's like so many emotions happened to me by really listening to you. Yeah. Your integrity, your humility. I really wanted to capture. I know you have such a busy schedule. I can't thank you enough mm. for giving us your time. I want to capture you, your heart, and who God is through you. You're a businessman. Tell our friend about your business, who you are, and background, and we could just talk yeah, back sure. and forth. No, that's easy. Um, essentially, I come from Australia, originally from Africa, but uh, you know, in the last 30 years, I've been in Australia. Um, as a, when I was a new Christian, I really struggled with reconciling my faith that I learned at church with the marketplace because I didn't see the, the, the actual connection between the two. So I, I particularly studied what Christianity should look like in the marketplace and and there were various dynamics that I learned how different it was to what I was learning what was being preached and I'm not criticizing what was being preached I'm just saying that in the marketplace there's a different application so once I was able to reconcile that and understand that the Lord had an assignment for each of us in the marketplace it was then a case of okay I better build my business to do the assignment that God wanted me to do so I built the business and and I was always a $2 million man. That's all I could ever do. But as, once I learned how to do the assignment and do it God's way, so righteously by looking after people, as I did that, the Lord grew my business so it became a billion-dollar corporation. You said to, to look after people. Absolutely. See, growing up in the Middle East, I thought business is like to get money from people. <laughs> yeah. I'm just being honest with yeah, you. Yeah. You open up a business yeah. to get money from people. You're of saying course. business in God's way. Yeah through your faith, Christianity is like yeah. to look after yeah. people? Absolutely. So if you go to Matthew 25, you see Jesus talking about sheep and goat nations. Yes. The sheep nations are the ones where people looked after people. The goat nations are the ones where people did nothing about looking after people. So it stands to reason then, if we look at all the social distress that is listed in the sheep nations, that the sheep nation people were supposed to fix and address, where did that come from? When you look carefully, you'll always find that all the social distress, the poverty, the starvation, the trafficking, the unemployment, all the things, that you, the persecution, the, the, the tribalism, the factionalism, the sectarianism, all comes from greed and self-centeredness, which comes out of the business world. So changing the greed and self-centeredness then fixes all of those problems. And that's what Jesus did on the ground, physically in first century Palestine. So we're just mimicking what he did. And if we do that, we all prosper. The whole community will prosper. So we should be doing business with a community mindset so that we all prosper. It's utterly pointless for me to centralize all the wealth and dumb everybody down into poverty and expect it to be sustainable. Because if everyone's poor, then wealth is suddenly finite. No one can do any more business. Yes. And that's what happens in the Middle East. It all ends up centralized into different families. And it happens all over the world. It's not just the Middle East. But it's because in the Christian mindset has been to go to church on Sunday and go back into the marketplace on Monday and compete for business in a corrupt economy. We never dealt with the corruption. You said Jesus dealt with greed and selfishness. Absolutely. And would you expand on that? Because when people in the Middle East, they hear about Jesus, yeah. you know, if someone said cup of coffee, I remember how the coffee is done here. But Turkish yeah. coffee is different, you know. Yeah. That's what they remember. When we say Jesus, we they think, oh, this precious prophet that came yeah. and wanted to turn people into Christians. And yeah. then later on, a Christian, they crafted his book. And that's the picture of Jesus. Or, or, or he healed yeah. the sick. Yeah. Tell us about the Jesus that you know yeah. through the eyes of business, yeah. that the one that is concerned about the society and what he did. Well, the first thing is to understand what was going on when Jesus was born. Okay, okay. so the... the, 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 the uh, first century Palestine, let's call it the Holy Land, was totally devastated by greed and corruption. So the priests from the temple had plundered their own people, had taken their wealth, had taken their land through the taxation system, kept a lot of it and passed the rest of it up to Rome. All right, That's been going on for by the time Jesus was living nearly 100 years, because in 63 BC is when the Romans invaded, right? And even before that with the Jewish Maccabees, they did the same thing to their own people. So for now, for a long time, these people have been plundered into absolute poverty. So Jesus is born into 
a, a, a community that is so poor, they are starving, there's trafficking, and so on. I'm going to pause for a second mm -hmm. because I'm getting goosebumps. There is so much poverty in Iran right now. Yeah. The Lord is just, you know, and Jesus is literally being birthed in Iran for the first time because as you heard the news, there are millions of people giving their heart to Jesus. When yeah. you said it, it just broke my heart because yeah. Jesus is being rebirth, you know, yeah. for the lack of better word, because Holy, he's appearing to people. Yeah, but good. what you said 2,000 years ago when he came to earth, yeah. the people, they were in extreme poverty. Absolutely. And he came to deal with it. And then same thing is happening in Iran right now. Pe yeah. People are in so social distress and poverty. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus is appearing. And that gives me hope because I want to listen to the rest of your story because this is the hope for anybody that is watching yeah. that this Jesus did this 2,000 years ago yep. and now he's doing it again in Iran and yeah. because it's not up to government, government yeah. no, no. to change this. We could talk about that in another program, yeah. but thank you because yeah. that really, it was like an arrow in a good way <laughs> in my heart that, wow, there is hope for Iran. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. There's hope for every country. Okay. But we, we've got to understand what Jesus physically did on the ground because that's where he set the benchmark for us. So Iran is no different, you know, because yes. you've got uh, centralization of wealth and everybody's plundered into poverty. So if we go back to the Holy Land, first century Palestine, Jesus is born into this very violent world, ruled by the Romans, plundered by their own priests, plundered by their Sadducees and Pharisees, which are the aristocracy of the day. So Jesus comes, first thing is, he tries to get the leaders to repent, to change their ways. But they won't change their ways because they've got too much to lose. They're controlling all the wealth. And Jesus is saying, take your allegiance off the wealth, put it on the provider of the wealth, which is God, Father God, and you will have a better society. But they don't. They've got too much to lose. So then he says, okay, let's get the system broken. Let's destroy the system that's creating the poverty. And so he goes after the tax collectors. The first thing he does is to get the tax collectors converted to become righteous because they are plundering the people. They are the conduit where the wealth goes through to go up to the temple and up to the Romans. So he gets Matthew, whose name was, was uh, Levi at the time. Levi, come, let me change your ways. And so he changes him, converts him into Matthew, uh, who we all know is in the book of Matthew and so on. The one that wrote the book of Matthew. Absolutely. And in Matthew 28, his, uh, Matthew 25 is the sheep nation narrative. So this is the tax collector telling us all these years later how we should live, right? Point being, he gets him saved, and then he gets a whole lot of tax collectors saved the same night. More than 200 of them ate dinner together that night, being of one accord to change the economic structure to deal with this poverty, okay? The, the, the effect on the revenue to the temple was enormous. And the priests were saying, what is going on? Where's all the money gone? Okay, because the tax collectors are now not collecting the taxes anymore. And he did the same with Zacchaeus in Luke 19. He did it over and over. Once he's got the tax collectors sorted out, he now starts getting people and he's healing them for free and saying to them, now you go and you go and show the priests at the temple because they're charging too much. Go and show them I've healed charging. you for free. They were overcharging. They were, okay. They, they always charged for, for healing, but these guys were corrupt. They were overcharging. This is what was the church in those days. Then he starts forgiving people for free. So if people committed any kind of sins, they had to go there to the temple and get forgiven. But they were overcharged. That's he why they were so poor. Free. He does it for free. Just to change the kind of the system. To it wasn't just he was just going around out of a... It wasn't random. Good, yeah, it wasn't a random. No, no. There's a strategy. He was deliberately cutting off the revenue to the temple and showing those priests that he was going to shut it all down. The corruption had gone. It was irretrievable. He needed to get rid of these priests. He needed to change the whole system. So he did that. And then, of course, he's feeding thousands of people for free. And you see that several times in the New Testament. He's feeding 3,000 and 5,000 and so on. They were starving. So he's feeding them. And then he goes in and he starts to trash the temple. Okay? So from there, he's now going after the money changers. And money changers, are, every time that they go up there to make their offerings, they ramp up the exchange rate. So the people come there with all of their, their, their coins from around the empire. They have to have Tyrian coins. They have to exchange. They don't have a choice. They ramp up the exchange rate. So now the money changers are plundering the poor people. Then they have to go and buy the doves, and the doves go up in price. The whole thing is driven by it's greed self and, and self-centeredness. Yeah. So Jesus makes a whip, and he chases them out of the court of Gentiles and into the street. This is why he got crucified. This is what triggered the crucifixion. Okay. Either way, he bankrupts the money changers, chases out the, the vendors of the doves, and then he starts to talk about the communion at the Last Supper. And then you'll find that communion and corruption are intrinsically linked. You can't separate them. 
He's saying in the same verse, the same sentence, that there's somebody, when you've taken the Last Supper, taken the wine, he said, somebody in this room has dipped their hand into this who's going to betray me for money, which was for Judas money. Iscariot, for 30 bucks. For and so then we move on to the actual crucifixion, where the, the ultimate sacrifice, where Jesus sacrifices himself, and the veil in the temple is torn. And in, in tearing the veil in the temple, that means the high priest can no longer go into there and come out with all of his lies about how we're going to put the price up. God told me, because he's in there on his own, right? So that's torn. And at that point, the whole sacrificial system of animals is now ended. Okay, and temple-based Judaism was was, was on its on its deathbed because it was irretrievable. The corruption, wow. the poverty creation, the human misery, the human suffering was all based on that greed that drove that temple. And it was only a few years later the temple was destroyed by the Romans. Okay, we have about I would say two more minutes, and I know three more minutes. And you said I'm going back to the very beginning. I told you, Dave, one sentence out of your mouth really is just. It, it's amazing. I, I, I encourage our viewer, anybody that is watching, to go back and really keep pausing. Just write down one sentence that you said and keep pausing it and allow the Lord to change that mindset because this is the word of life. Yeah. And you went back to, in the beginning, you said something about greed and self-centeredness. Yeah. We have two more minutes. Would you want to share something or pray for people that if they want to give up that grieve, I mean, uh, greed and self-centeredness and invite Jesus into their heart. Anything you want to share? Okay. That's it. The important thing, uh, uh, inviting Jesus into your heart is easy, and that's not a problem, and, and millions do that. The problem is we don't actually change our ways. We've got to change our ways. If you go to, uh, is it what's it, 2 Chronicles 7, and look at the, the concept of, of where, where the Lord says, if you change your ways, I will heal your land. They don't change their ways, they won't heal the land. Okay, so if we want the land healed, we, when we do business, you and me doing business, I must do business with your interests at heart. Okay, so that everybody prospers as we do business together. That is the whole message of Jesus. Change your greedy ways and actually carry it out so that the whole community prospers together. And we create human flourishing instead of human misery. That is the kingdom of God on the ground. It's much more than just being saved. Okay, being saved is just the first place. To me, being saved, that means that you receive his forgiveness. Yes. Then he can come and live inside your heart. Yes. Then empower you, you know, because we can't, but a lot of good people we have in the planet, we say, Dave, we love your message, we're going to do it. Yeah. But if they are not being empowered by yeah. the Holy Spirit, they yeah. can't really do it. Well, that's right. Okay, so the Holy Spirit's going to help them do it, but, but they need to change their change mindsets, mindset. their hearts and minds. Repent means to change your hearts and minds yes. and do business wow. from God's perspective, not from the greed perspective. That's the key. Greed or God? Pick today. Yeah, Which God's one will, you want? God's way. That's what it is. It's I, God's I, I, way I, that we I need. called my wife. I said, Susie, one sentence changed my life when you said God's ways, yeah. God's will. Yeah. Those two, they have to go hand to hand. Yeah. Okay, we're going to do more program, but, uh, but thank you so much. This was so amazing. <laughs> it just really gives me so much joy for so many people yeah. to hear you and Good. to hear this message that brings life and changes economy yeah. and changes the whole nation and changes the family. But Absolutely. as you said, he said to change your ways yeah. right here from greed to God. Yeah. Thank you. Greed to caring and sharing. Yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome. Wow. God bless.